two types of people in the world. There are those that eat to live and those that live to eat. How many with me? Those live to eat types of people. I love food. Anybody that loves food out there? My wife enjoys food. I love food. I mean, food is just one of those things. Ever since I was young, I learned uh, math equations. I learned my fractions with my mom in the kitchen. That's the best way to learn math is making cookies and cake. Thank you, Jesus. See, I love, I love food. I, I, had, I had a passion for culinary uh, ever since I was a little kid. When I, I tried to impress my wife uh, when I first met her and, and I was trying to woo her heart, I made her the worst batch of chocolate chip cookies anyone could ever have. And she said they were terrible. So I was determined to make the perfect chocolate chip cookie. And 20 batches later, we perfected that amazing recipe. See, food wins people's hearts. That's why my wife is with me today, is those chocolate chip cookies. See, I love food. I mean, there's something powerful that food does. It brings people together. But how many here know that when you are given your plate of food at the restaurant and someone tries to take something off your plate, something switches right then. <laughs> something possessive comes over you. Territorial. You ever, like, try to touch your dog when he's eating that, that little dish? Same thing. Same page. When someone tries to grab something off your plate, it's like, this is my food. This is my, my possession. And it's like, ooh, that looks good. Well, you should have ordered it then. <laughs> if it looks good, order it again on your dime, not mine. This is my possession, my food. I'm with you. And, I, and again, I, I've grown over the years, but how many remember in the, in the mid-2000s, the whole organic craze just exploded on the scene? Everything had to be organic. And there was this scare. Again, organic food is important and it's good. But there was this scare. It was like, it's organic or it's not organic. And it's poison if it's not organic. That's kind of how it felt. And you had those people that you would sit down with at your dinner table. And they'd be like, is it organic? And you're like, no. Oh, I'm so sorry. And you know, Have you ever met those people? Like the organic snobs? I was one of them. I hate to say it. <laughs> Morgan's loving this story right now. But, but there was one thing that, that there was no organic compromise over, and that was your milk. You had to get organic milk in the mid-2000s because there was the scare of RBST, all this hormones in your milk. So I was determined to find the greatest organic milk you could buy. And the greatest organic milk was the organic cream top, non-homogenized milk at Trader Joe's. That milk was incredible. It was the perfect milk fat to milk lactose ratio for your Oreos. I promise you. It was the best milk you could get. The only problem is it was like $5 a half gallon. So, I mean, this stuff costs like three times the price of gas. Like, it was just expensive, expensive milk. Fuel for the soul. Well, anyways, so I would get this organic milk. We often have people come in from England that would visit us because my wife's from England. So... They always have tea. They drink tea several times a day. It's always tea time in England. I honestly don't know how they accomplish anything in their day with all the tea times that they are constantly taking. It's time for tea. It's time for tea. It's time for tea. Oh, is the kettle hot for tea? That's just the common conversation we have. I mean, the Lindops can attest to this. They understand this pain. Well, we have these friends over, and, and they just love their tea so much, and they would always ask for a bit of cream. Well, cream to them was, was the milk in my fridge. So, of course, I'd bring out my organic cream top, non-homogenized Trader Joe's milk. And they're there, and they have a cup of tea, and they have a second, and they have a third. Then nighttime comes, and they have more cups of tea. Well, I wake up in the morning, and I make my protein shake with this organic cream top milk at the time. And I go and open the fridge, and it's gone. They've been up since 6 a.m., and they are just feasting on the milk in my fridge. They're having granola and more tea and granola and more tea, and I have no milk. I am so mad. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to be like Jesus. Did you guys enjoy your breakfast this morning? Oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. I'm going to go get some more milk now. Thank you so much. So I go get some more milk. The same pattern repeats itself the next day. And I go to Rachel. I'm like, Rachel. Yes? They're drinking all of my milk. Yes, they're guests. They drink and eat what we bring them. 
but you don't understand. This is organic milk. She's like, so? Just buy some more organic milk. I'm like, you don't understand how much this costs. She says, buy more milk, Brandon. Get over it. So I go to Walmart, buy the most basic milk I can buy. Like, take your hormones. Take your conventional milk made in a factory. They're drinking away. It's my way of getting even. Well, Rachel sees my attitude in my heart and confronts me on this thing. I'm like, okay, I'll surrender my milk obsession, my milk possessiveness. A few weeks later, our friends come over. The Haynes family, my good friend Keith, was my youth pastor growing up. We're there, and, and we do the, the best dinner you can do, breakfast for dinner. How many agree? Breakfast for dinner is, is one of the greatest modern inventions you've ever had. So, I mean, it's perfect. There's, I have homemade cinnamon rolls and strawberries and raspberries and perfect scrambled eggs. I mean, it is a perfect day. Well, right at the end, Keith's like, hey, can I get some coffee? And Rachel's like, sure, I'll make you some coffee. And he opens my fridge. He's like, ooh, is that heavy whipping cream? I said, yeah. And I just bought some organic heavy whipping cream to make organic ice cream the next day. And he says, can I have some? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> and it's just, he's like, really? I'm like, yep. And Rachel looks at me in the kitchen with like these eyes, like, are you kidding me right now? I'm like, what? And he's like, I only need a little bit. And he's like, I'm like, no. I've actually measured it perfectly. You see, I'm making organic ice cream tomorrow, but I have some plain Walmart milk in the corner if you'd like some of that. So Rachel leaves me this, this look. You know, I'm, I'm in for it afterwards, and now it's this awkward time. I mean, it's just awkward. And I'm stubborn with my cream, right? Well, they leave. She's like, what's the deal with your milk obsession? I was like, I don't understand. And she says, listen, Brandon, fa- food is not more important than family. I'm like, oh, man, you just feel the spirit of the Lord on that conversation. So when I first preached this story, I then brought Keith in the middle of service, a massive thing of organic heavy whipping cream, just to make repentance happen in our relationship. You see, America has a strange relationship with food. We just do. Food's an odd subject. See, there's one thing that's true, specifically in California. You can always be sure of this. People are in three states. They're either on a diet, ending a diet, or about to start one. That's just the life of a Californian. That's the life of an American. See, when we look at just the basic meaning of the word diet, the modern definition is this. It's the kind of food that a person, animal, or community habitually eats. That's what it meant. It comes from this Greek word, which means the way of life. However, it changed its definition slightly in the 14th century. You see, the French started to use this word very rarely to describe a medical-based diet where there was some type of prescription based off of a health concern like gout. So they started to slightly use this phrase, diet. However, it spiked in its use in 1963 by the advent of one particular company that made this word famous. Any guesses? Weight Watchers. Here we go. So Weight Watchers gets revealed and becomes the crave. And now we see this usage of diet is synonymous with calorie reduction. That's what we have, and that's what we now know. And our culture, every time when you talk about food, we're always giving these pre-qualifiers. Is it gluten-free? Is it vegan? Is this paleo? Is this keto? We have all these different qualifiers on the food that we deliver. You see, this obsession with food gets so strange that C.S. Lewis, in his brilliant book, Mere Christianity, it's a bit difficult to read, but again, so profound. He talked of a day where a country's dysfunction would be exposed by how it treated food. And in Mere Christianity, he writes this. Now, suppose you came to a country where you could fill a theater by simply bringing a covered plate on stage and then slowly lifting the cover so that everyone would see just before the lights went out that it contained a bit of bacon. Would you not think that in that country something had gone wrong with their appetite for food? It just so happens 
that today, June 23rd, is the annual Blue Stone Bacon Festival in Keystone, Colorado. Here's a picture of the festival. Do we have that picture right now? So right now, thousands are gathering today in Colorado for the Bacon Festival to celebrate the magic of bacon. And the end of the festival, the crowning moment is this, the bacon eating contest where they come and bring bacon on platters before a crowd. How C.S. Lewis wished he wasn't correct in his prophecy. We have a strange relationship with food. It's, it's dysfunctional where we either feast or we live in famine. There's no in between. We either are living in this strange place, this weird relationship with, the, with food constantly. Now, I come from the, the 80s. I'm a child of the 80s. And, and in that day of red 40 and blue 30 and yellow 20, of gushers and fruit by the foot and dunkaroos, all the commercialized food that we knew, the most processed food generation in the history of the world. And we had one regretful thing that was asked of us every day. That was to eat your vegetables. How many remember this? And the, and the modern American family had like one vegetable on their plate constantly. You all remember this plate. It consisted of a few things. You had tomatoes, onions, iceberg lettuce, and dreadfully broccoli. And you had to shove this down. And most of the time, you remember this age? It was microwaved with cling film over the top. That's how we ate. And that was our context of vegetables. That was what we understood. But here's what we have to understand. In Genesis 1, there is this picture of life that's a little bit more than three to four vegetables that you eat in your American diet. There's this context of food that is so much more vast. Again, Genesis 1, 11 and 12, that God said, let's put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and trees of every kind. See, there's a little bit more variety than what we've been accustomed to. It just so happens that right now, in our seed bank that we keep, there are those that really make sure that we have the right seed varietals. There are nearly 10,000 different varietals of fruits and vegetables that are available to us today. When the average American eats between 10 and 15 different fruits and vegetables on average. You see, the reality of creation is a lot more color and a lot more vibrance and a lot more flavor than just some broccoli and tomatoes on the side. We have a lot more variety in regards to what God has done. Here's what we have to think. The most creative being in the universe is who? God. And we give him the most boring diet to his credit. The most creative being in the universe is God. And we have allowed the modern food industry to dictate what variety looks like. And here's the hard part. A lot of us try in our dietary lives to live healthier so we go back to what we kind of knew when there's a whole other world that God wants to reveal to us that's a little bit more vibrant. Now, this is not a pro-vegetation conversation that we're going to have right now. But the reality is this. The average American eats nearly 2,000 pounds of food a year. Nearly one metric ton of food a year is what we ingest. The most in the history of the world. The average person back probably in Jesus' time, five to 600 pounds at most. We, li we literally eat four times the amount of most in human history. And many of us would think that we eat some, some eggs, some chicken, some beef, some pasta, and maybe a fruit vegetables. But nearly 50% of the American diet consists of two ingredients, corn and soy. 50% of our food is soybeans and corn. Now, the corn that we have, most of it, a lot of it goes to petroleum and glucose and high fructose corn syrup. Literally every food that you buy at the grocery store contains this ingredient. And we think about how God designed us and how little we actually live off with what he's provided. 
We wonder why we're so sick. We wonder why we struggle with so much obesity. Because we've allowed manufacturers to tell us how to live and how to worship. See, the reality is food was never separate from Israel's relationship with God. God was always a part of their diet. He was a part of how he taught them to live. And we've allowed our relationship with God and food to consist of a small prayer before we eat God knows what. And you ever heard that prayer before? Oh, God, bless this food to our bodies, and please don't let it be, you know, make us fat. In Jesus' name, amen. See, we have to really rethink what does a life of worship look like? Not just what does our diet look like? What will it look like to honor God, not just at the temple, but with our temples? What will it look like to really think of incorporating God back in to our life of worship and making sure our temples are healthy? It's a conversation that you can feel is awkward and difficult, but necessary. We need to ask ourselves, what does it look like to steward my life in a healthy way? See, we have a dysfunctional relationship with food in America. But there was also an understanding we have to understand here is that there's a reason why we have a dysfunctional relationship with food. And it goes all the way back to the garden. Genesis 3. Let's look at this together. It says this, And Adam was driven out of where? The garden. Adam was no longer allowed to be inside of the garden. And in return, what do we see? The nation of Israel, the people of God, live in a constant state of famine. Every patriarch now lives in a place of leanness. We find this in Genesis chapter 12. What do we have? We have Mo Abraham, right when he's sent out, is living in famine. Then we have Isaac, as he's sent out, is living in famine. Then we have Israel, Jacob, and his sons, what? Living in famine. Famine was a part of the life of every person in human history until now. You constantly did not know when your next meal would be. You would not know when the next time you would be able to have harvest in your house. So they constantly were believing and praying, God, would you provide for us in the midst of famine? So what does he do? He separates this people called Israel. And here, I believe the cure is here for our food problem. He separates Israel and he gives them two important instructions. The first instruction, he says, you will be assigned to the nations by this one act and behavior you do. One day a week, I want you to celebrate a Sabbath. Exodus 31 says this. You yourself are to speak to Israel. You shall keep my Sabbath, for this is my sign between us. So what would happen? On the seventh day of the week, on the Saturday, they would have a day of rest. Why was this a sign? Because in every culture in human history up to that point would work seven days a week. There was no weekend. It was every day was a hard day. Every day was wake up, till soil. Wake up, till soil. Because you never knew when you would not have soil left to till. There were raiders and marauders everywhere. When we've been working with a food scholar, her name is Cynthia Schaefer Elliott, and she said the average person in Israel had famine three out of every five years. There was drought three of every five years with no food preservation and storage at hand. This is how they lived. So the first sign that Israel is to have is to live a Sabbath, and that'll be a sign to the nations that their God provides for them and works even when they don't work. This is an amazing sign. How many Americans know that we don't know how to rest well? We know how to collapse well. We know how to binge watch well. But we don't know how to worship with rest. Did you know rest is a part of your worship practice? Not laziness, which is what a lot of us would define rest as. But active rest is actually how our bodies recharge. 
See, what many of us know is what we call passive rest. So you ever like leave your cell phone on and you forget to put it on sleep mode and the battery dies? You ever have that happen before? Or you leave something, Morgan's like preach. You ever have those times when you leave something on, your car light on, you know that time when you keep the car light on, you come back to a dead battery? That's called passive rest. And passive rest is literally watching TV and doing something that's not an active behavior. It drains your batteries. You ever felt that before? You've been sitting down for hours and you get done and you're like, I feel so tired. Because your body is not able to recharge. It's on idle. Your body's burning fuel and not able to replenish itself. We have to learn how to rest well. See, what they call it is, is active rest. And what if we actually took our Sabbath, our days that God has given us based off of our work journey and asked how God wants us to celebrate the day? Did you know God likes to go on hikes? You know God likes to go to the beach? You know God likes to go to the park? God likes to take naps. Genesis 2, and God rested and said it was good. You see, we have to engage with behaviors that are healthy practices. And just doing this all day ain't rest. That's not restoration. See, the word recreation literally means recreation. How do you recreate how God's made you and intended you to be? And for all of us, it's different. For some of you, it's music. For some of you, it's art. For some of you, it's cooking, which is awesome. You have to find that which recreates you. And guess what? For all those people right now, specifically those moms, they're like, well, that's selfish, neglectful behavior of my family. No, it's putting the oxygen mask on in the plane before it goes down so you can help others. You have to put the oxygen mask on in the plane before you can help others. That's appropriate worship and stewardship and care of your temple that God's given you. So what happens is he commands Israel to rest. The second thing is he does, he commands Israel to feast. He says, seven times a year, I want you to have a party that'll make everyone in the world want to be us. I want you to have a party so big and so epic that everyone will know who your God is. And here's the reality. They often feasted in the times of famine. Another thing they would do, they would often feast before the war was over because they knew their God would see them through. When you study the patriarchs, when you study the book of Kings and Samuel, there was these feasts that happened in the midst of difficulty. Because when you're forced to feast, you're forced to trust God. When you have to end your reserves, you're forced to trust him to bring more in. So the life of Israel was this. The daily diet was this. They would take grain at night, soak it so it would be fermented. They would eat it for breakfast. They had some type of cereal. There was a whole grain, watered, boiled cereal. They would then take a piece of bread at, to, the, to the field, there was no extensive lunch. There was no snackables back in the times of Israel. They would then maybe eat this bread, maybe graze grain off of the field that they would work. They would then come back at night for a vegetable stew that would be shared with the family. Every day. That was it. No meat, no eggs. They were lucky they had cheese. Until feast time happened. And at feast time, it did not matter how poor or rich you were. Everyone got to eat. Everyone was invited to the feast. Because you're part of the people of Israel. You're part of the people of God. So the scholar we meet with says, they, they only ate meat when a, a calf was about to die. And they would share it communally or at the feast. And what we notice is that feasting is communal. Now, when we hear the concept of gluttony, we hear it a few times in the Bible. We often associate gluttony with obesity. 
here's the thing. Here's the, here's the thing about, about gluttony. I really believe this. As you study biblically, gluttony really isn't about someone's weight. It's about what they worship. Gluttony isn't really about what someone looks like on the scale. It's about what they declare as the focus of their life. So you can live as a glutton and be rail thin. It's because you've hoarded things to yourself. I believe the modern gluttony issue in America is this. It's actually feast deprivation. Modern gluttony is feasting in secrecy. You feast because you feel like you need to feel that which feels insignificant inside. And most food-related issues are because of how you view yourself or trauma from the past. You work with counselors, and they'll say most of the time, it's rarely diets that fix the weight problem. It's healing the trauma that works out the rest. See, when you have community, it's this crazy thing. They say that when you're with community, that if you live an unhealthy life, you'll live five to ten years longer if you're in community than if you live a healthy life of diet and exercise alone. In community, you can live unhealthy and live longer than the gym slave on the weekdays if they're by themselves. Loneliness is the epidemic. Loneliness is the issue. And when you have communal feasting, guess what? You have to make sure there's enough for others so there's already moderation built in. When you feast communally, if you, if you've seen those people that go first, and you know that mom, I love that mom in line, save some for the rest of us. <laughs> you know the mom moderators? Hey, one at a time. Seconds isn't yet. Everyone hasn't eaten. Praise God for that mom. <laughs> Praise God for that mom moderator, that line moderation. Today at the rib cook off. Thank you, Jesus, for that mom. Because those mom eyes come, they burn like fire. It is like the Holy Spirit in the eyes of a mom bring repentance. You see, communal feasting brings moderation in. It brings a problem. What if we said, what if we said this? What if we just saved really nice things that we know are bad for us when we ate together with our friends? Because guess what? You can't eat a lot because they'll look at you bad. You know those people. Ooh, another. Ooh, it's like homeboy, you got a problem, man. What if we actually had built-in moderation systems called community? And we have these seven feasts that actually sustained the health of the Israelites to survive in famine. They were forced to feast. I believe feasting's our problem. We don't know how to feast together. We've learned to feast alone. We've learned to eat our way to sickness. And we've let the modern commercial industry dictate to us what health is like. We think that it's just confined to Israel. However, we have Jesus bring a new definition to feast. In Luke 22, when he initiates the Lord's Supper, what happens? He breaks the bread, drinks the cup, and says, do this in remembrance of me. And T. Wright says, listen, this was not some proper church building that he did this in. This was in a privatized home. And they would have a full meal, not a snack. They wouldn't just have a little rice cracker and a cup of Welch's grape juice. Communion was a meal. It was celebrated. And from that point forward, it wasn't just Passover. They celebrated it weekly. And Luke, who writes the book of Acts, then continues this theme that every day they would gather together, and weekly, we read this in Acts 2.46, they would eat and break bread together. This was the communal feast of the saints that would happen. We then have Luke continue this all throughout Paul's journey. In Acts 20, it says they broke bread, they feasted together, then Paul would teach. 
And what was powerful about the feast of the new church, of this modern church, was that no longer was it just for the Israelites. Everyone was invited. No longer was it segregated for those that God had chosen. If you were baptized, you were welcome. And you would eat together and celebrate together. And your economic status didn't matter. It didn't matter how nice the stuff you brought was from. It didn't matter if your bag was from Whole Foods or Food for Less. It was all a part of the same table. Now, we look at the book of Acts as this idealized view of the church, and that was right for them. But here's the reality. The first century church continued this practice all the way until the time of Constantine. Weekly, they fought for the feast. They fought for community. They fought for getting together. Because guess what? Sometimes in most poor families that now lost their jobs because they followed Jesus, they didn't have anything to eat during the week. And many of them would eat one meal a day, until they got to feast together on Sunday. They lived in a famished state, but they knew that they could feast with the family of God. You want to reach the loss? Have them over for dinner. You want to come see some people get saved? Make them some ribs at your house. He's like, preach. See, what we have to understand is this was so sacred and so important. We have this guy named Tertullian who is this first century, you know, uh, famous father of the faith. He's the guy that invented the word Trinity. He writes this as rumors started to spread in Rome about the church. He says this, It is mainly the deeds of love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us. He says their, our love was the identifier in culture. They say this, See, they say, how they love one another how they are ready to even die for one another. One in mind and soul. We do not hesitate to share our earthly goods with one another. All things are common among us except our wives. <clears throat> it's a good thing. That's a good thing. It goes on to say, Yet about the modest supper room of the Christians, our feast explains itself by its name. The Greeks call it agape. It's affection. Whatever it costs is gain, since with the good things of the feast we benefit the needy. The participants before reclining taste first of prayer to God, as much as eaten as satisfies the cravings of hunger, as much as drunk befits the chaste. Moderation is built into the community feast. He says you eat till you're full, you drink but don't get drunk. There was this communal aspect to feasting. It continued to spread so much about the feasts of these Christians that rumors spread in Rome that they were having these Thyestian feasts. Now, this man Thyestian was this famous parable that was taught by Homer where he was deceived into eating his own child. And they called the Christians the cannibals because weekly they would break bread and eat the Son of God. This is honest fact. It was so concerning that Caesar is noticing how the Christians are impacting the economy. He sends this man out named Pliny the Younger. And all you microbrew guys are all excited once they said that. I know you are. Anyways, here's Pliny the Younger, a real historical character, writes the letter back to Caesar. He says this, they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as if he was a god. They bound themselves to oath, not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery. When this was over, it was their custom to depart and assemble again to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food, not children is what he's implying. Accordingly, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses. But I discovered nothing else except depraved, excessive superstition. This is how the world sees us. This depraved, excessive superstition. But see, when they see feast, they see family. And family is what our whole culture is longing for. We have to ask the question, 
Is there room at our tables for others to join? Is there room at your table to let your witness matter? See, God's given us this gift called the feast. We just have to learn how to worship well with it again. He's given us this gift called food, and we have to ask ourselves, how do we honor God with our temples and live in a way that honors him? Today, you're not going to be prescribed a diet, but I will challenge you to this. Invite the Holy Spirit into your eating habits and patterns and ask him, how can I live in a way that worships you well? Invite him to your table and say, God, how can I make room and who are you calling to sit with us? And maybe then we'll see the revival we're praying for. Maybe then we'll actually see the promise of Acts 2 come to pass and not just be some story we tell that one day we hope happens. This morning.